is an area of so-called strange metals. Now, if you don't know what are strange metals, don't worry. I'll explain it to you as we'll go along. But the background of this is this, which there are many experts here in the audience, is this ADS-CFT duality, which is this incredibly impressive finding of about 20 years ago now. It's really revolutionary in theoretical physics that tells you that certain strongly coupled field theories, quantum field theories, especially if they do not have an energy scale, so-called conformal field theories, they have an equivalent mathematical description in terms of a weakly coupled string theory. In other words, you can do perturbation theory in a negatively curved space-time in, in ADS. And so the, the, what this has done is taken certain very difficult problems. Strongly coupled means you cannot apply perturbation theory. You have to use some different way to try to understand what the physics is. But nevertheless, you can now mathematically translate it into something where you can use perturbation theory and try to understand what it is. And it was already immediately realized at that time that this could give you a new road to an old dream. The dream, of course, being verifying or giving experimental realizations where string theory has something to say. And that, that's really what happened. And immediately after the, this discovery, already a year after, Witten, Edward Witten tried to apply this to the regime of QCD, in particular the strongly coupled regime of QCD. As we know, QCD is asymptotically free. As you go to lower energy, it becomes more strongly coupled up until you hit the confinement scale. And then uh, several years later, it was realized that instead of looking at sort of single particle X scattering experiments, maybe ADS-CFT is better to describe the many body collective physics where some of the microscopic details are lost. And this was a very successful effort. In fact, one of the big efforts here in, in Barcelona. And then from that, it was a, an, an, uh, not that big of a jump to try to use this to strongly correlated collective systems, in particular condensed matter systems. And that's the area where I am going to uh, discuss today. And so there's, there are two essentially big messages that come out of this is uh, why would you actually believe that ADS-CFT has anything to say about condensed matter systems? We think we know condensed matter extremely well, basically since the 50s, 60s, all the stuff that you know about metals and semiconductors was already written down in the textbooks, so why do we need it? Or what does it do for you? And the two main things that it does, is it tells you that it's a generating functional, it's a way to generate new, what's known as uh, non-trivial infrared fixed points. So in real life condensed matter physics, of course, at the heart, as any textbook will tell you, is just the Schroeder equation of non-relativistic electrons surrounding atomic cores. But in real life, that's not what you solve. If you want to so address the issue of magnetism, you write down an Ising model. So you make some approximations and some simplifications. And that's trying to characterize or trying to grasp the essential infrared physics that you want to know. And ADS-CFT is able to give you new types of systems that we weren't able to understand from this picture of electrons orbiting or in an electronic lattice. And then there's a second aspect of it, is that not only does it give this fundamentally new insights, it turns out also that when you want to compute things in condensed matter physics, often at finite temperature, and that is a, in quantum field theory, for those of you who know a little bit, that is, it's possible, but it's very hard. And it turns out that ADS-CFT gives you an incredibly magically superior method to compute these things. So uh, both these aspects play a large role in this. Now, what is the area where you may want to apply it? As I said, as I started, right, condensed matter physics, many, many materials we understand in incredible detail using uh, <coughs> standard tools of condensed matter physics already for 30, 40, 50 years. So what are, what are the mysteries or where, where does it still, uh, are there questions to be posed? And the area where I'm going to try to apply it is so-called the strange metallic phase of high TC superconductors. We all know high temperature superconductors, these are very exotic materials, usually copper oxides with some rare uh, earth materials. And what the essential of this part is that they show a superconducting behavior. Here is a phase diagram of these materials where you have the temperature here and this is the whole doping, right? So you replace one of the uh, building chemical materials by an object which has more uh, electrons in the syst system than, uh, sorry, more, uh, less electrons in the system, then you get a whole doped system. 
And then if you hold open to roughly about 20%, these materials show superconductivity at the order of 100 Kelvin. Now this, we know from the standard theory of superconductivity, falls outside of its paradigm. In the usual way, the famous bardeen cooper schrieffer theory of superconductivity, it is literally impossible to get superconducting temperatures right, uh, at ordinary uh, circumstances that are much more than 20, 30 Kelvin. So something here is going on that falls outside of the textbook uh, condensed matter system. Now, uh, actually the superconducting region itself, below 100 K, that turns out to do fall into this Bartin cooper schieffer class, but it's the onset, it's the regime above this temperature. That is where the mystery is. If you study this area, it's called the strange metal, in the same way that other mysteries in physics are called dark matter or black holes, this is a strange metal. This is the puzzle that we want to solve. If you look at the properties of this object, it is very, very strange. So let me explain what is strange about these strange metals. What should a theory, therefore, give you? Well, one is that if you look at the resistivity as a function of the temperature, it scales linearly with the temperature. Here is uh, some early data from the 90s. Here you see the resistivity. This is uh, the temperature scale, and you see it is almost perfect straight line all the way down to the onset of superconductivity. That is this, this big jump here. And this is very strange because in ordinary metals, like I said, we know exactly how to compute these things. We take our electrons, these electrons scatter. They're, that scattering causes some friction. This friction is the effective uh, cause of the resistivity. And if you compute this in ordinary metals at low enough temperatures, Right? You, can, you can compute that it scales as the temperature squared, not as the temperature. So this is really uh, a, a big difference between these two metallic systems. The second thing is if you look at what's called the AC conductivity, so now you don't put a constant electric field on it, but an uh, in time uh, varying electric field, and you measure the conductivity, which is the inverse of the resistivity in this system, as a function of the frequency, there is a very strange power law behavior in the mid frequency range. If you compare this again to ordinary metals, you have a very different response. You have a, what's called a, a Drude peak, which is just the fact that uh, there is some friction in the system. If you translate something, it wants to stop again. There, uh, but if you uh, <coughs> make the frequency high enough, it, the friction doesn't have time to enter. So there's this drop off, and then there's what's called, uh, there's, a, there's some small fuzzy noise and then at some moment what you have if you make the frequency of the electric field large enough you get high frequency behavior and you can get interband transitions transitions between the electronic shells in the system so this is a characteristic signal of a met of an ordinary metal which looks very different from what you see in these turning metals and in particular you have this power law behavior and in physics always if you see power laws something interesting is happening a third puzzle is what's called the whole angle versus the DC conductivity scaling. If you look at the whole response, the whole conductivity in the system, and you divide it by the longitudinal resistivity, just the resistivity measured in the same direction as the electric field you apply, you find that this scales as 1 over T squared. Now that is puzzling, and I will explain a little bit more later, because in ordinary metallic systems you can show that the underlying physics that sets this scale and the ordinary DC conductivity should be the same scale. So if you know that this scales, well, whatever, in an ordinary matter as T squared, then this should scale as T squared. But if, it in, if this scales as T, then you expect that this also should scale as T, because it's set by the same physics. So here something puzzling is going on. And now one of the ways to explain this, and there are other experiments that, that are this, is that actually really what happens is that you can, this mechanism must be in some way or another different. And if the mechanism, it's, but it's deeper than that, it should be that there are other charged degrees of freedom than to explain this. And uh, if you have other charged degrees of freedom in a system, then you don't get that resistivities add due to different processes. If you have a single electron system and there are different ways of scattering, there are different ways of creating friction in the system, you simply have that to first order and perturbation theory, DDs just add, so it's like resistors in series. But this behaves more like resistors in parallel. And there are lots of other things, but these are sort of the four main things that a theory of a strange metal should explain. 
And like I said, this is not an exhaustive list. So let me do, do a, go a little bit more into this whole angle puzzle. Like I said, if you look at microscopically in a textbook, how do you explain what the, how the resistivity behaves and this whole angle, you find that it's directly proportional to the scattering time, the average time scale between two scattering events of electrons. And if you compute this for the whole angle, you find, again, also, this is just exactly proportional to the scatter, average scattering time between uh, electrons. So here you see, in any theory, these objects must scale in the same way. In an ordinary metal, the scattering time precisely scales as 1 over t squared. Uh, now, in a strange metal, we know that scales as 1 over t, but if there is this single scattering time that determines everything, these objects must scale the same way. And you clearly see from experiment this is not the case. So the only way you can explain this is some way there are two, there's not a single electrons are not responsible for charge transport in this system, but some way there are other objects. You need what's called an uh, inverse Matheson law in the language, but in a rather simple picture, this is just the aspect that there you have resistors in parallel rather than resistors in series. So then, then you can have that there are multiple scattering times in the system because I have one object, one resistor that corresponds to one scattering time and another resistor that corresponds to another scattering time. Then you're not there yet, but this is a minimal ingredient that you need to explain these systems. Okay, so <coughs> let's now try to see how uh, very quickly what people have done in the past. In, in condensed matter, in a nutshell, the idea is that if you look at these low energies, DC, responses, direct current responses, there's a very low frequency, you look at the low frequency excitations in the system of low energy excitations and roughly speaking if you have a system of bosons when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking there is a protected state, the Goldstone boson, which most of you know now and that is the object in which you explain it. If you have an object which is built out of fermions, electrons then, uh, and you have a number of them, like in an atom then you can show, of course, due to the Pauli principle, they can't always be, all be in the same state. If you have a free Fermi gas, that means they all must be in a different momentum state. And uh, that gives you a Fermi surface in this system. And then if you now look at the small energies, uh, excitations around this Fermi surface, you find that the Green's function, the probability of finding a particle with uh, uh, momentum omega and, and momentum energy frequency omega and momentum k given a particle at frequency momentum zero and momentum k it's given by this this object the propagator and if you expand this around this Fermi surface you find this object that looks like it behaves like a massless particle there's no mass term in this object and it's in terms of this fermionic quasi particle that behaves like a massless object that almost all uh, conventional metallic physics is explained there are some exceptions to it if you have BCS conductivity, but this is the picture that you have. Now, in this system, I haven't put the interactions yet in, but if you put in interactions, there's a small change to the system. In quantum field theory language, it's called the self-energy, but then this is where the scattering between the electrons is encoded. And already, very quickly, after the discovery of high TC superconductors, some, uh, okay, so if you, one second, one step back. In ordinary metals, you can compute this self-energy and it scales as omega squared. And then in a, in a sort of very quick dimensional analysis type calculation, that also means that if you put the system at finite temperature, this uh, object scales as the temperature squared. And this actually is this temperature squared resistivity that you measure, should measure in metals. So what people did, if I know that this uh, gives me the temperature squared response in metals, there's a very easy way that I can phenomenologically, because I have no way of computing it, but suppose now I had a self-energy which behaves as linear in omega. For mathematical reasons it can't be strictly omega, then you would just change the coefficient of this number, so you have to put a log there. But if somewhere or another there was a theory that gave me that the self-energy, the way these electrons scattering, scales with the frequency of this, and I use my dimensional analysis trick, then I get this linear in T resistivity. Okay? And that was uh, a guess that was made very early on in the, in the system. But now I want to already warn you for something that I've already said a moment ago with this whole effect. This again, this phenomenological story assumes that my simple electrons are responsible 
for all the transport in the system. We've already seen that if you try to do this, right, you are going to run into another problem. The whole, the whole angle anomaly you cannot explain because there you need at least these two degrees of freedom. Nevertheless, it is a very nice idea, but you have to be careful because it makes this secret assumption that, all, that there are these single electrons that are uh, responsible for transport. Now, <coughs> the reason why a strange metal is so hard is that the way you compute these things is using perturbation theory or in a sort of particle-like picture. You have little particles, the electrons that scatter around and then you can compute these objects. But there is a deeper notion that uh, is related to all the scaling behavior that's observed. If you remember from statistical physics, if you look at second order phase transitions, the classic example uh, is magnetization, precisely at the critical temperature, right, the correlation lengths, which is sort of the average distance between two magnetization pockets, diver diverges. And instead of having an exponential fall off, you get power law behavior right at this object. And if you go a little bit further and consider this as a quantum field theory, not a an, not an statistical mechanics problem, you can show that all the excitations or all the Green's functions in the system do not have particle-like excitations in the system. Their physics cannot be described in terms of particle-like language. Now this is very exotic, but it happens only at a specific point. Nevertheless, it's a very interesting point because precisely because it no longer refers to the underlying particles in the system, this physics is very universal. Now, there is a way that you can take a system which has a critical temperature uh, Tc and as you change another parameter in the system, this critical temperature can decrease. And in fact, you can arrange it such that the critical temperature of the system becomes zero. And now something very magical happens. If this critical temperature becomes zero, right, that means that sort of the finite temperature effects, which normally damp quantum effects enormously, suddenly that damping is lost and that means there is a regime right above this um, point, this critical point, where the system remains, inherits all this funny scaling behavior in the system. In other words, in this regime, you cannot describe the system by quasi-particles. And uh, this is an example of a so-called heavy fermion system where you see this type of behavior. What is plotted here is the scaling of the resistivity as a function of the, as a power of the temperature, where in these regimes, this is an ordinary metallic system. You see indeed the two squared behavior. The exponent T, which is plotted here, is blue, is two. But here you see this fan-like behavior um, where all of a sudden the scaling exponent changes to one, just like in the strange metallic systems. Here the extra parameter that changes the phase position is uh, the magnetic field. Now this is, I said this, and this is not a strange uh, high TC cuprate strange metal. This is an, another type of exotic condensed matter system, but the, the, the suspicion is that this is precisely also what goes on in these strange metallic system, and that the strange metal is such a quantum critical phase. Now you can say, hey, a, this is a strange phase, it's also called a conformal field theory. Now maybe this is exactly the regime, or, or another reason why you may believe that theories without an energy scale, everything is power law, there's a chance that string theory may, or these ADS-CFT, may have something to say about it. As a preview, well, what does it say then, before I go and explaining some of the details? If you do this, when you apply this to these exotic systems, you find the following result, is that the strange metal, metal is a state of matter that consists of two sectors, and one of these sectors is a quantum critical state. Now, this tells you immediately, just qualitatively, some things. You have two sectors, you have two simultaneously coexisting nearly independent degrees of freedom. There are naturally two long-lived lifetimes in the system. And because it's quantum critical, you automatically get sort of a lot of this power law scaling behavior in the system. And just from these pictures, you see automatically you should get this property that conductivities add rather than resistivities. You also get something that is seen in an experiment that because there are now two sectors, that means that if you have an unstable particle or a particle that decays, it cannot not only decay to itself, but it can also decay into this other sector. So all particle-like excitations are significantly broadened. But like I said before, the quantum critical sector itself has very non-particle-like behavior. There's lots of scalar behavior and it's very uh, universal, doesn't depend that much on the details. There are many different of these high TC cuprates.
And one other aspect is that is very well known if you study these systems theoretically, these quantum critical systems, remember you had to really fine tune it, they're actually extremely unstable. If you change the system, you give it a small kick, it wants to actually go to a very ordinary state, like an ordinary superconductor or an ordinary metallic system. And that's also what's seen in experiment. And then the other key thing is that not only does this holography give you this, but it also gives you a computational framework to understand this. So let me now tell you exactly where these things come from. And somewhat for the expert in the audience, the fact that you have these two sectors is an old idea. I, we didn't uh, come up with this out of string theory, it's just string theory gives you these. And, that, and, and other condensed matter systems that have these two sectors features share many of these features. The really novel part that string theory gave in is that the idea that one of them should be a quantum critical state, which has unparticle-like behavior and where you can compute a lot of these scaling responses. So here's the very simple picture of how these things can explain it. This is uh, again this whole angle in strange metals where we have to explain somewhere or another that there are two scattering times in the system. And I already said before and I will explain to you uh, in several times there are these two sectors. There's this quantum critical sector and then there's this other sector which behaves usually a little bit more conventional. So that's why I've called it conventional order here. But now you can have uh, how can you now explain this system? Well, one of the interesting things is that this quantum critical sector, it doesn't just quantum critical, but it also happens to be at what's called a charge conjugation invariant system. It is as if this object, this sector, has as many positively charged particles in it as as many negatively charged particles in it. And then something interesting happened. If you now put an electric field in a system where you have as many particles as you have holes, then uh, the electric field will want to accelerate the holes the, the, the one way and the particles the other way. And if there are just as many holes as particles, you see that the net momentum flow in this system is actually zero, even though I have a current flow that moves forward. So these are objects that do not, are not sensitive to the way momentum uh, is lost in the system. They are very insensitive to the normal way the friction in metallic system happens, which is just the electron scattering of the atomic lattice. But since there's no net momentum flow here, uh, this sector is now not sensitive to that momentum degradation in the system. And moreover, if you now do this in the whole angle effect, because you have just as many ho ho holes as particles, even it, when they bend, they now seem to uh, have move in the same direction. So now you would say now they are are sensitive all of a sudden to the momentum decay, but because again I have an, the same number of holes and the same number of particles, the net current now in this direction is zero. So the interesting part that this lifts this quantum gravity set does not depend on the or does not contribute to the whole angle conductivity. So I have this whole sector that can contribute to my longitudinal conductivity, but does not contribute to my whole angle conductivity. And now you can see a way how to separate these systems. In detail it is more tricky, but you see sort of the, the way you can, uh, the fact that you have this other sector gives you a freedom to get around the bounds that you had before. So let me now go into a little bit more detail where these two aspects come from. And one of the big uh, aspects that's happened in the last four or five years is that these unknown new trivial fixed points were found about eight, nine, ten years ago. And to many condensed matter physicists, these looked very weird that you had these two sectors to survive. It goes a little bit, a bit against your grain uh, and your intuition from studying many examples. But now there have been conventional condensed matter models just built on fermions and a Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian, the so-called SYK models, that have exactly these same features. So I can now point you to systems which, where you don't need string theory. They have uh, a lot more detailed information and you're a little bit less free to match it to experiment, but nevertheless, qualitatively, they fall in the same universality class. So what happens in string theory? Well, holography is the idea that if you take a theory, or the, its idea, it's, you can sketch holography, the idea behind holography as follows. You take a system and now you coarse grain. So you average over various spins and then you build a new system for the average spin. And you average again, and you build a new system for the averaged spin. And if you now stack all these theories uh, on a row, you get something that looks like, actually, this actually looks like one of these anti de Sitter type spaces in the system. And you can, what the string theory has done is make this very intuitive idea 
mathematically precise, where you really have that the partition function in the CFT can be explained in terms of the gravity theory in the system. And there's a whole dictionary where you can translate the objects in the gravity theory to the objects in the CFT. And the main part here is that we want to study condensed matter systems, so we have a finite density of material. And what this dictionary tells is that systems at finite density means that I have to study charged black holes in ADS theory. Now, one thing I want to emphasize, I've, I've mentioned this conformal field theory, this theory without a scale in the problem on which ADS is based, but uh, that is not the theory that we want to study, use for the strange metal. Remember, I had this picture that in condensed matter physics, really you should start with the Schrodinger equation, but in practice you study sort of simplified models of a BCS superconductor or a Fermi liquid or an Ising-like model. And what's really the puzzle is that people don't know how to get to a strange metallic system using ordinary, these ordinary insights of how electrons behave in atoms. Now what we're going to do is we're going to replace that Schrodinger equation by a CFT. And this is the CFT that we're going to describe in ADS CFT. But then I want to trigger, I want to still apply a simplification to go to low energies. And then I want to get at the system of the strange metallic phase. So, and there's a reason because we know exactly from string theory what these type of CFTs are. These are usually supersymmetric large N Yang Mills theories. And that's clearly not the physics that you want to describe in a strange metallic system. But the idea is if I trigger an RG flow and I flow to a new fixed point, that this new fixed point, even though it started from something very different, has the features of the strange metals that we want to see. So that's why when you start with the theory, you get a theory as follows. I needed some energy dynamics and then the dictionary tells me I need gravity. I needed some charge dynamics and the dictionary tells me that I need to put a Maxwell field in my uh, gravitational theory and I need something to trigger this RG flow, to set me off, to start to go away from my Yang-Mills theory towards this strange metal. And sort of generically you can do this by a scalar field, there are other ways, but the simplest type of theory is this. And if I now look at charged black holes in the system, now I find something very interesting. The infrared, the, the low energy physics, which is the near horizon physics, that's what it translates to, almost always looks in the following form. And so this is something you should compare to your general relativity textbook where you have the Schwarzschild metric that looks like this. This is what happens in the uh, uh, R going to horizon limit of these systems. And the interesting part is that if you look at this near horizon limit, there is this emergent symmetry in this system. If I rescale T by some power lambda Z and I rescale X just by lambda X, this metric is invariant. And that's precisely what gives you this emergent scale invariance. I have a, a scale which is lost in the system because I re can reparameterize my system and get the same system back. And that tells you secretly already that the, or this is the essence why you find in these systems a Lifshitz quantum critical theory and then, like I said, I, I usually need something to, uh, like this field phi, to support this system. It's really mutually supporting. If I take this guy away, then this falls away. And if I take this guy away, then my mutual is right. Now, one of the things that immediately happens is because I have this scaling error, whatever I'm going to compute, I'm going to find lots of power law behavior, just like in strange metals. And the second thing is because I have these two sectors, I need this other sector to support my Lifshitz system, I immediately find that in my system I have two types of contributions to transport. I for free get this inverse Matheson law. I haven't done, I've barely done a calculation and I already have two characteristic features of strange metallic systems out of it. So now comes, yeah that's very quick, you can arguably say and you will be right. Now comes the the million dollar question. Can we really honestly take these very quick sort of ideas and compare them to experiment and really make some statements about uh, high TC cuprate strange metals? So a number of years ago we convinced our experimental colleagues, these gentlemen right here, to spend some money and some time and some effort to really do this. And we've been uh, working for the past two, three years and I will show you some of the things that we have done. And one of the main reasons that we were able to convince them is to, uh, was based on some data that was already available. And for that I need to explain one or two more things. Remember this fermion spectral function, this is the Green's function for a single fermion, which has a dispersion relation near the Fermi surface. 
of which is cos of omega minus vfk, and then there was this self-energy part. So this was also computed in holography. If you want to study holography and you want to believe that this is true, you better be able to also get sort of Green's functions like this out of it. Otherwise, you can already go home from the beginning. So indeed, we, can, we find in holography that our ground states have a beautifully clear Fermi surface with a Green's function of this type. Okay? The, <coughs> one of the mysteries, though, is that this self-energy, when you compute it, is not this omega squared behavior that in ordinary metals, but it's an omega to a, a power and this power is a free parameter in the system. Now that is very interesting and also surprising. It means that these holographic systems can describe a whole different class of systems and you can just match the power to what you see in experiment. And really this here is a, there are sort of three types of classes of experiments. One which looks very much like ordinary metals. Then actually for nu is one half you get precisely this marginal Fermi liquid, this phenomenological theory that people wrote down in the 90s as an explanation for strange metals, but now it's no longer a phenomenological theory. Now I really have a, a full uh, Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian, even though it's written in terms of black holes, but where this self-energy now rolls out of your system. And then you can see something like this, and actually if this new KF is less than one half, you really see some exotic behavior. This is uh, the imaginary part of this Green's function. This is the spectral density. And these things you can actually measure in experiment with something called an angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. This is literally the pictures which experiments produce. So here is a prediction for experiment. Now very briefly, just to tie it back to the theory, this really is one of these, especially this is really one of these systems without quasi-particles. They are Fermi surface-like excitations but there are no particles whatsoever. And what really happens is that I have a fermion, right, and, and what a thing that an excitation in a quantum field that wants to be an electron but it interacts with this quantum critical sector and in this regime that interaction is so strong that it decays before it has a chance to realize it's a particle. Here that's marginal and here I have a particle like excitation but I have this broadened line width because it can still decay into this quantum critical sector. So here you see this two sector story. I have an, something that wants to be an ordinary electron but due to the presence of this quantum critical sector, it behaves somewhat different. And this is crucial because it means that if I now compute the resistivity or any other transport phenomena in the system, it does not follow from the electrons alone. This sector is there and I should also take it into account. Now what was so exciting is that we, this was computed in 2009-2010 and in 2015 there was a group in Boulder, Colorado led by Dan Dassau who actually in a, in a high precision ARPES measurement measured precisely the self-energy. Here this is this, uh, the imaginary part. Here you see it's the same symbol and here you see for various different uh, samples the OD means this is an overdoped sample, this is, that means that the, you are, have put so many holes in it that the superconducting temperature goes down again, this is optimally doped, that's where the temperature is the highest and this is underdoped. So three different samples. Now when they try to match theoretically what these curves look like, they found that their ordinary metallic results did not match. They had no idea that there were these crazy guys trying to match string theory to strange metals, so they just came up with a phenomenological formula that matched their data. And this is the formula that they came up with that matched their data best. Look, it is precisely this formula when you make the temperature very, very small. In fact, even the alpha is exactly this new KF that uh, we and many other people that worked on this predicted in 2009. And if you see what happens in this system, you find uh, that as you change the doping, this alpha parameter actually changes slightly. Precisely at optimal doping you find alpha as one half, that means it scales as omega to the one. This is this marginal Fermi liquid story. But you also see that as the doping changes, it becomes a little bit less and a little bit higher than one. This is the moment where anybody who works on critical phenomena should jump up and down and they say this is very weird. What you're measuring here is, a, is an exponent in the system. The whole idea about exponents is that these are very robust. If you change small things in the system, some prefactors change, but the exponents should not. So what really is happening is that, is that not, you don't have a quantum critical point, but you have a, actually a line of critical points, each of which has a different characteristic exponent. That's what this experiment suggests. Now, this is very weird 
and it's, it's, it's certainly not something that you see very often in condensed matter physics. But uh, oddly enough, if you do very high precision measurements on the linear resistivity, so a completely different experiment, you measure the resistivity as a function, you also find that this linear in temperature cosponent resistivity also seems to originate in a regime, uh, in a band of doping, not in a single point. So there are two indications that this is actually a rather interesting system where you have a line of critical points rather than a single critical point. But let's go back to this experiment where they showed this. And this was a real trigger for us, or this was what helped us convince our experimental colleagues that they should really spend some time and some money and some effort in doing this. And here are some recent results from this summer from our collaboration. And I want to thank especially uh, our collaborator in this project, Eric van Heumen, who has been leading this experiment. So this is the same measurement by the group of, uh, the same measurement that the group of the South did. It's just that we did it, or particularly the group van Heumen did it, this summer. Here are three different samples. And here you see, again, this imaginary part of self-energy with power law fits in it. Now, especially the people in the back, you can barely see the difference between the fits and the actual data. It really shows that the, the, the measurements that the Dessau group did are really what is reflected in these cuprate materials. And if you now to try to extract or fit the same type of function of Dessau, what you find is we don't have the best samples yet. We are only in the overdoped region. But if you, you see these are the solid images here, and these are the open images here are from the Dessau data, and these solid ones are data from our group, they are fit perfectly within this framework. So this is very, very exciting. It really says that, that uh, what the Sao measured four or five years ago is really going on. There seems to be this parallel behavior and it seems you, this is fits, falls right into the class of uh, computations that rolled out of holography. And now you can really try to play a game. I'm just going to illustrate it because these two are, are too specific. But once you know that this is happening, you can now try to have a back and forth with your experimental colleagues to really vali validate this. One is that I said that this quantum critical sector is there in addition to the electrons. And there is a way formally, mathematically, that you can expose this quantum critical sector directly by looking at a different part of the spectral response. If you look near zero frequency for KSKF, you can compute that this exposes directly the quantum critical sector. In real life, this is probably not measurable. It's hidden in the noise. Nevertheless, it's something to think about. Another aspect is that in real life, these computations were done in an I ideal system where you forget the fact that you have an underlying atomic lattice and umklop scattering. And if you do that on an, uh, if you redo that computation in this section, you find actually that you don't have this pure power law behavior, but you have some sum of power laws that behave in a very particular fashion, even though the, the various here I've all given them the same strength, the strength varies, uh, but you may try to fish this out. This is a very interesting aspect that the Green's function turns out to be no longer periodic in these systems. But this is a back and forth you can now have with your experimental colleagues to really see if this is going on. So this is one aspect. Now let's go to the one that many people think is the hallmark of these strange metallic systems. This is the universal in linear resistivity. In ordinary metals, what actually happens is that the resistivity, as I said, is predominantly determined by the momentum relaxation in the system. And the predominant momentum relaxation is actually the electrons scattering off either the atomic nuclei in the system or in various impurities in the, last, in the lattice. It does not come from electron scattering of electrons itself. So it's really set by some microscopic quantum physics, and this is what you compute in uh, <laughs> your theory of condensed matter course. There is, however, another scenario possible. Suppose these electrons were very, very strongly coupled. That means that the mean free path between these electrons becomes very, very small. And if, especially if it becomes small enough, what can happen is that instead of thinking of this as single electrons, you should think of this as a collective many body system, which then lives in this, in this atomic lattice. And one of the real powerful things is that the collective many-body physics at, at low enough temperatures and frequency is given by a universal theory of hydrodynamics. So if the system is very, very strong, strongly coupled, maybe I shouldn't think of single electrons and umklop, but maybe you should think of some hydrodynamic theory which lives in a uh, lattice-like background. 
This is extremely powerful because this hydrodynamics is a universal low energy effective action. I'm now somewhat presenting it purely on the hydrodynamic aspect, but this is also something that directly comes out of holography because holography describes these strongly coupled systems and you find that there is this hydrodynamic regime in the system. Now one of the interesting aspects is that uh, if you do this very careful, you find that there is a possibility that of, the, uh, of a contribution to the current proportional to some free parameter called sigma q. If you open any condensed matter textbook, this term is not there. It's not there for either one or two reasons. In real life systems, this one doesn't barely contribute. And moreover, especially if I take non-relativistic systems, you can actually prove the non uh, Galilean symmetry forbids this one from appearing. But if I have a, an emergent relativistic-like scaling, as I have around the Fermi surface, this object can definitely be there. And this, I mean, you compute this, you immediately get that this sigma q is like a second sector. It is indeed a second sector contribution to the conductivity. One of the aspects in condensed matter physics where people have realized that this secretly there is in uh, charged neutral graphene. This object there plays a role. So in, the, in these systems, the hydrodynamic tells you indeed that the transport doesn't need to be from the Fermi surface excitation alone. That's given by this sector. Now what the... Uh, what is one thing that we do? We, we, this is an, a, a very condensed story from something that we learned by studying many of these uh, objects in black holes. But what we learned is that since hydrodynamics is a low energy effective field theory, but you need to some way or another put this momentum relaxation in, and usually this is done in, a very, in the following um, formulaic form, that the the, what really sets the DC conductivity is this, there's some operator and either an impurity operator or an operator representing the lattice periodicity and uh, once you compute the two-point function of this operator and compute uh, take this combination then you find the DC resistivity in this system. Now what for choice and everything then boils down simply to what is the choice for the impurity operator. What we realized is well actually since you are working in a low energy effective field theory where the whole idea is you only have the currents and then some stuff you can forget about the most logical choice for this impurity operator is one of these operators. And if you take the energy density, in other words, you think of a varying uh, potential energy landscape, then the advantage is that this correlation function has a universal answer. It doesn't depend on any of the details. And it tells you that the resistivity is proportional to what's called the shear viscosity in the system. And then you need one ingredient from holography that tells you that the shear viscosity is very often proportional to entropy density. And you find a sort of phenomenological formula that the Resistivity is set by the entropy density in the system. This is a very simple but a beautiful universal result that may explain precisely why the system describe a linear and T temperature. Because one of the things that happens is that in almost all these systems you find that the entropy density in the system does grow linearly with T. It's called the Sommerfeld law. In an electron system you can compute it, but also these high Tc cuprates have this behavior that the entropy density at low temperatures is linear in T. Now this may sound like a crazy idea, but various people generalize this. And this actually, uh, this precisely this mechanism is what happens in graphene. And for some of you who may know that people have found this hydrodynamic electron flow behavior in graphene, uh, in these systems, and it's precisely based on this scenario where the only thing that changed is not that they changed the energy potential landscape, but the charge potential landscape in these systems. Now, again here you can do the same thing. You can now do two different predictions for uh, experiment. One is that uh, if I look at the resistivity, because the resistivity is proportional to entropy density and every entropy density is proportional to T, and thanks to the third law of thermodynamics, we do not expect a en remaining entropy density at zero temperature, it means that if you extrapolate this line, right, down to t is zero, it should cross precisely through the origin. And this is a, a recent result from 2017. And indeed, these guys, when you read the paper, they, they see that exactly this. They can't really uh, go all the way because the superconductivity set in, but if you would extrapolate all our data, it goes through zero to very high precision. This is indicating perhaps something interesting is going on. Normal metallic systems always have a residual resistivity, even at zero temperature, but this seems to indicate there is none. 
But an even more interesting result is uh, the following. Remember that uh, the entropy density scale is t, but if you look preci more precisely first at the resistivity, here you see the resistivity as a function of t. It behaves beautifully as a straight line. However, the slope, if you're very careful, changes slightly with doping. If you look a little bit more precise, you don't, you don't look at the scaling behavior, but the coefficient in front of it, it changes slightly with the doping. Well, if this story is correct, right, that also means that the, uh, that the entropy should change slightly with the doping. And in this experiment from last year, these people, they measured the specific heat in the system. The specific heat precisely gives you the coefficient of this linear factor. And even though, as you see from the data, it's very uh, scattery, the error bars are very large, here they show that the specific heat, indeed, as a function of doping, also goes down, just like the resistivity. So at least qualitatively here, there is again a scenario that fits this larger picture. Now, uh, and now so these are two of the big things. I'm going to tell you uh, one more. But here's an idea that we had already very early. If you want to understand this strange metallic phase, some of the, the, what you really want to understand is the onset of the superconductivity. And in these black holes, also you can compute this using uh, this, this holographic aspect. And what you really see is that this onset of superconductivity, which is measured by what's called the pair susceptibility, it really gives a characteristically different uh, signal than in ordinary metals. And there are experiments that can do this. And I just want to put this out there for you because this is, we think, is one of the big uh, experiments that needs to be done still. Here there are no results yet. But here is another uh, aspect. Remember, this is the onset of superconductivity, but we're now going to go a little bit to this area, this underdoped area where you have something called a pseudo gap and a charge ordered state. I'm not going to go spend in too much detail, but uh, the, the important part is that at zero doping, all these high TC superconductors are actually insulators. They are a funny insulator called a MOT insulator, which is really locally jammed charge pinned to the underlying lattice. What do I mean by that? If you have a very characteristic density of electrons, where the density of the electrons is precisely that you have one electron per atomic lattice cell, then something very funny happens, is that these electrons, they, uh, they want to form a, a grid because they electrostatically repel each other. And this grid then locks into the underlying atomic lattice and it doesn't want to move. There's a small energy barrier to move. That is called a MOT insulator. They're usually anti-ferromagnets because the spin alignment of the electron wants to be opposite. So a MOT insulator is this locally jammed charge pinned to an underlying lattice. Now, if you want to describe this in ADS-CFT, where you have no electrons, you, you can do the same thing. You can have local lumps of charge that are pinned to this underlying lattice. And now we get into some more detail, but you can describe this very beautifully in holography. It's called charge density wave order. And it, uh, in holography, you have to do some funny things for this. You have very uh, interesting something. It's intertwined with something else called loop current order. You must have some spontaneous currents in this system. So here you see the charge density wave, that's this blue, uh, yellow, blue, yellow. But here, in these charge density waves, there are spontaneous currents flowing. Of course, this is a, a snapshot. This current must close and loop like this. This might sound very exotic and strange, and this has to do something with your black holes and your strange thing that you have to put this in a virtual space-time of five dimensions. But this idea of loop current order is a very old idea by Varma to explain <coughs> precisely what is this quantum critical point that governs strange metals. And you can find reviews by Varma that describe that in a, inside the unit cell of copper and oxide, you should have spontaneous currents that behave as follows. Now, if in this black hole context, I precisely do the same thing, and instead of having a homogeneous charge lattice, I make some locations of charge larger and some smaller, the copper has large charge, the oxygen has smaller charge, then what you find uh, is a flow pattern of these spontaneous currents that looks like this. This is exactly this flow pattern that was first written down by Varma in a completely co different context earlier. This is, 
this is still unpublished. We don't uh, really know what to do with it, but the, the serendipity that this falls out out of a, a black hole computation and matches precisely this pattern is just is rather striking. But let me go to, to a non-serendipitous statement. One of the things that when you find is indeed you find these charge density waves in these scoop rates. This was a big experimental effort of the last three, four years. And one of the rather mysterious things is that uh, these charge density waves always have a period of four times the lattice spacing, independent of what the doping is. This is very strange because if I take your picture of particle-like electrons and I add an electron, like I said, for electrostatic rep repulsion, they want to form a periodicity, but immediately when I add one electron, I lose that periodicity compared to the underlying lattice. That periodicity changes. But in experiment, you see that if you add one electron or subtract an electron by whole doping, the periodicity of this object doesn't change. And that's actually the same that's seen in this holographic experiment, because we've, we've not, we're not looking at single electrons, we're looking at these charged puddles. And these charged puddles can absorb and give away a little bit of charge without flowing, uh, without changing their underlying periodicity. It is an extremely simple picture, but it is, it is actually uh, a way to explain what's seen in experiment. Now, one of the other big mysteries in this object is that, remember, these are called mod insulators. Anytime you pin, right, there is a resistivity in this system. So when you hit the insulating phase, you should see no resistivity left. The weird thing actually is, is that when you look very carefully in these cuprate superconductors, uh, this is uh, the, the, the resistivity, this is the superconductivity. They now suppress the superconductivity with magnetic field and then try to measure the resistivity again you see that there, the resistivity indeed goes up, but it doesn't go to infinity. There is some finite resistivity remaining in this system. This is very strange. It should just be a very ordinary MOT insulator. How can you explain this system? Well, in holography, this is precisely what we see again. This is the resistivity measured in this holographic version of a MOT insulator. And here you see indeed the insulating moment, the moment this, this state forms. And the resistivity jumps tremendously, but it doesn't go to infinity. There's always something remaining. This is precisely the fact that I have these two sectors. Roughly speaking, the, elect the, the naive electronic particle sector gets frozen, but I always have this quantum critical sector that remains and can continue to give a finite resistivity. Now, one thing I already explained to you in the very early beginning, it was uh, picked up by Mike, Blake and Donalds as an explanation for the whole angle. The interesting part about this remaining part in the conductivity was that it had this emergent charge conjugation invariance. It seemed like they had as many holes and particles in this system. So not only do you have a contribution of two sectors, this second sector is charge conjugation invariant and it should therefore have no hole effect in the system if you measure this. Right? Because there are precisely as many particles and holes I put in a magnetic field, they both flow, but they both contribute an equal amount. This summer, uh, in the National High Magnetic Field Lab uh, in Florida, a group tried to measure this precisely in this charge density wave state. And what they found was the following, that precisely when you suppress the superconductivity large enough ma with magnetic field, you find that the whole conductivity in these systems is exactly zero. I forgot to put the, uh, uh, the four digits here, but the, these articles are out in the archive, you can check them. And they precisely phrase this in terms of an emergent charge conjugation invariance in the system, which is rather puzzling. I want to emphasize once again is that the, the fact that you want to measure electronic uh, responses in this area is already puzzling because it should be a mod insulator, there should be no responses or however. There, but there is a sector that contributes, and now it's been shown that this sector is charge conjugation invariant. But this is precisely what holography predicted. Uh, it is really uh, amazing. And if you now add all these things together, right, there's this two sector theory, one of it has an, a Fermi liquid, it should have this scaling in these ARPES uh, line widths. There are some other aspects which I haven't, just, haven't shown you that also fit beautifully with experiment. There's this idea that you can explain this universal linear T resistivity with sort of an, that emergent electron hydrodynamics. 
And now in the charge density wave mod insulator state, you both have this doping independent uh, commensuration. The fact that as you change the doping, these charge density waves wants to stay at four times the lattice spinning. There's this mild insulator, which, which I mean there should be this remnant uh, charge it, and the fact that you have this whole conductivity. Uh, zero in this specific state. This really, if you add it all up, starts to feel like you should believe there is something there. We honestly believe it and we will want to go there. But many of these results really follow from this theory of a strange metal that is this object which flows out of holography. It's a state of matter consisting of two sectors. One of them is this charge conjugation uh, symmetric quantum critical state. Where holography has given you the insights that this fixed point should exist as an infrared fixed point in the system. And many of these things that people measure, uh, our colleagues measure in experiment, can be computed in a very superior way with holography. So, if you want to add all this up, I want to conclude with what, are, what would really convince, in my views, the community that you should take this seriously. Well, one is, this, that's why I wanted to briefly mention it. If you really measure the order parameter susceptibility, the onset of superconductivity in the system. And this should really reveal this quantum critical origin of the system that can explain the high temperature in the system, the fact that it's not ordinary BCS in a very, very clear way. Then the second one I already mentioned, it's related to the fact that it can explain the linear and T resistivity, but the real aspect is it that the underlying assumption is that the electrons behave hydrodynamically just like they have been shown to behave in charge conjugation symmetric graphene. And one way to measure this, for instance, is if you really see sort of characteristic hydrodynamic features like turbulent flow. And then the third real smoking gun is really the fact that this remnant sector is a charge conjugation invariant critical state. And the charge conjugation symmetry is measured by the zero hole response in this pin state. And that's really, uh, for, this is the, the message that I want to leave you with. It is really exciting, as you can tell. Many of these results are from this summer or past summer. And uh, I really hope that uh, this will realize our dream to apply string theory to experiment by explaining the strange metal in terms of black holes. And thank you very much for your attention. So the key feature why you want to look in this striped phase uh, is that there are these two sectors and precisely what if in, in the striped phase what you do is you, you basically have an emergent uh, breaking of translational symmetry which is very very strong because it's spontaneous and emergent. And so what it basically does is out of these two sectors it completely lifts the sector that is sensitive to, moment, to momentum relaxation. And so therefore it should expose this quantum critical sector in its most naked form. So if, if there are other ways that you can really break translational invariance very strongly in other systems, maybe not by a pin CDW ways, you, sh you should expect the, the same type of physics. It's just that in these, we know that in these coupe rates these states f happen to form and so we can use that leverage to actually do this experiment. Okay, and I, indeed I wouldn't know because I don't know that these, uh, these other materials are not, in my no to my knowledge, known to form CDW states. And so you, I cannot do this experiment, but if there's another way, some way or another, I can make translation invariant breaking strong, then I, I, I should expect. What you want to do is you want to, add, right there, these two sectors, and some way or another, you want to only study the one sector. And that's, that's, that's the accident that, or the fortunate aspect that happens in this CDW state. Because in principle, you want to study the strange metallic state on its own. You don't want to go to these other exotic systems. Yeah. 
Yeah. I would imagine for, it's hard for um, if you are on the matter theory, but yeah. you see the inverse matrix and or I would sounds strange to me that no one came up with this idea of oh, this means that we have to add a two component <coughs> theory. So fun, but say you get this insight from string yeah. theory or gravity. How much wants to take this idea and forget about holography say I'm going to take uh, Marginal Fermi Lewis yeah. and add another sector. How much of that can, can you compute of the experiment? Well, um, so 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 this this I mean, uh, this you are correct, completely correct. This idea came not out of, of string theory. I mean, uh, if you go back to my slides, for me to flash back will be a bit too much. But there are references already in the very early days, the first moment this whole angle was measured. It was Anderson and Pierce Coleman who realized you needed these two sectors and you needed an anti matheson law. And there are examples in the literature where people did sort of these two lifetime objects. The new, what I would say, the new aspect that string theory brought is that, that you made one of these sectors a quantum critical sector and the other you kept ordinary. Uh, but once you have that insight, you can compute many things, not all, but just using ordinary condensed matter theory. You don't need black holes for that. Although often, like I said, many of these computations are at finite frequency real-time responses at finite temperature and holography just turns out to be a very efficient way of calculating it, in that sense superior. But in principle you can compute it completely using ordinary condensed matter uh, physics. The insight really is, is this, the, this step. No, in, in all honesty that is, that is uh, the story. And actually that's why also I'm trying to explain it that way. I mean, uh, this, the holography has taught us a lot, but uh, many of these lessons, once you have extracted what's the essential physics, you don't need the black hole story anymore. Okay? Second question is, how, is there any actual string theory to what uh, besides VR? Um, almost all these computations are classical uh, GR. There's not much uh, string theory uh, and since, since we are being honest here, right, the, the key thing is, of course, that in, you, when you try to compute things in, in, uh, using GR, you take a large n strongly coupled limit of, of the system. Now, there have been a number of studies where you look at the, the higher derivative corrections, so away from strong coupling, and then you see many of these features stay. The, 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 the one that you should rightfully so as a condensed matter physicist worry about, and the one that are also hardest to compute on our side are the one over, uh, one over n corrections. And there, uh, at this moment, we simply have little to say, but we, ho we hope for the best. And, and seeing that so many features come out of experiment, uh, miraculously so, we forge forward, but with this, this, uh, you know, this warning to ourselves in the background. The so so the, the yes let me let me side try that so there there is this quantum critical sector which contributes and and indeed if you look at the these holographic computations that is that is uh, the same sector that contributes a lot of the scaling behavior in the strange metallic phase and in the in the pin CDW phase. The, the overlap is not 100%, there is there's some subtlety in it because there is some part of it which is also sensitive to momentum relaxation. But in, in essence the answer is yes. Somewhere or another this, this sector, because it's charge conjugation symmetric, is not very sensitive to momentum relaxation and therefore it survives when you, when you block that sector. And that's why in that phase you really expose this feature of the strange metal. metal. 
inserting the 